This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey, happy Friday. This week we saw a massive Bluetooth hack which allows you to open Teslas and other devices without any sort of authentication. Free to play games had a massive quarter and are doing incredibly well. And Russia got some help with chips from China. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week start with Sony's new $200 Link Buds S. This is $20 more than the regular Link Buds, which had the donut hole and went for the fully open ambient sound. Those are still on sale and remain a different product. While the Link Buds S close that hole again, they add active noise cancellation and silicon ear tips and compete with Sony's own higher end 1000XM4s, but in a much lighter and more comfortable package that is also made of recycled plastics. Weird, but cool. Also this week, Huawei launched its foldable Mate XS2 in Europe, as well as a bunch of watches and fitness bands. But the Mate XS2 had a price tag of 1,999 euros, which is far more than the Fold 3 and kind of ridiculous for a company that is having trouble selling phones abroad already. Next up, Lenovo announced the ThinkPad C14 Chromebook for work type situations. And apart from the standard specs, like up to 12th gen Intel i7 CPUs, it features a Google Assistant button, which is pretty rare on computers, and a Google Titan C security chip with the base model starting at $629. Acer held a spring global launch event, which was fun because it was weirdly hosted outside in order to show Acer's green credentials for using recycled materials and glass and so on. The headline launch devices were the Swift 3 OLED, a $900 14-inch OLED laptop that brings OLED into mainstream consumer level pricing, two new portable monitors designed for 3D content creators and a laptop with 3D as well. It has a screen that can apparently seamlessly switch between 2D and stereoscopic 3D, so you can play games in 3D for example, though at least one reviewer didn't really enjoy it much, saying that quote, I wanted to turn it off and quote, it hurts my eyes. <sighs> I guess it's still not the year of 3D monitors yet. And finally, right about now, Qualcomm should be launching the 8 Plus Gen 1. Yes, 8 Plus Gen 1, made on TSMC's 4 nanometer process. It's pretty much the same chip as the current 8th Gen 1, just from a new fab with higher clock speeds and expected better thermals and efficiency. That sounds like an improvement over Samsung's production of the 8th Gen 1, because uh, Samsung sure had a ton of problems with those. Okay, my first story of the week is going to be a new hack via Bluetooth. Although, just for once, maybe Bluetooth is not actually the one to blame. The story is that with just a hundred bucks of hardware and some code, researchers managed to hijack Bluetooth secured devices. To prove it, the researchers managed to open and even ride a Tesla, which of course now means that many people are paying more attention. You know how you can set up devices like a Tesla or an e-bike and so on, so that you can just walk up to it with a paired Bluetooth device and your pocket and it unlocks automatically, well, that's what they're exploiting. The type of hack here is called a relay attack and it's really just that. There's a pretty funny simplified version as an image someone made on Wikipedia, so let's look at that and explain. This is you and this is your car. Someone near you sends your device an authentication request with a custom Bluetooth device and then relays your answer over the internet to someone standing next to your car, which beams your answer to the car and and voila, it's opened. According to the NCC group, a cybersecurity advisor and the researchers behind the hack, a ton of devices are vulnerable to this, including smart locks for homes and offices, cars, as we've seen, and many more. And particularly worrying could be laptops with a Bluetooth proximity unlock feature enabled and phones that use paired Bluetooth devices to prevent them from locking themselves. Now, there are a few devices like the Apple Watch, which uses Bluetooth low energy to unlock iPhones, but which also adds another layer of security on top in the form of a time of flight measurement via Wi-Fi to see how far the watch actually is from the iPhone instead of just trusting Bluetooth. Samsung just announced that their car key tech is based on UWB ultra wide band instead of Bluetooth and both iPhones and Android use a mix of NFC and UWB when used in digital car keys as well by default. So it's really just Tesla and other companies like it choosing a lazy implementation. Not great when you're blocking, you know, a freaking car. Okay, and my second story of the week is going to be a short one describing just how much more money the game PUBG made when it decided to become free to play. 
Developer Crafton used to charge $29.99, but then went free to play on January the 12th this year with optional in-game purchases. One of those was Battlegrounds Plus, a one-time $13 upgrade that gives you access to ranked modes and in-game items like a hat. Active monthly users apparently nearly tripled, but revenue from PC sales also went up by 61% and console revenue was up 124% from the previous quarter too. PUBG was one of the last games that decided not to become a free-to-play title in the past, but apparently this change has really paid off. A bigger audience also lets the likes of PUBG charge more for in-game IP collaborations, as we have seen with Marvel and Star Wars becoming canon in the Fortnite universe and so on. Unsurprisingly then, Fall Guys, another game, also just announced going free-to-play as well, and Ubisoft's next hope, Roller Champions, which comes out in a few days, will also be free-to-play, among a myriad of others. Meanwhile, just last month, we saw Microsoft looking at figuring out how to add ads to the free-to-play Xbox games, and within a few days Sony is also looking at the same for PlayStation in games. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with the free-to-play business model as long as companies offer you things like hats, but of course there are perverse incentives to offer things like loot boxes and more, which can be terrible, but this definitely seems like it's the future of gaming and maybe one day companies will start paying us to play. Okay, and my third story of the week is going to be Russia maybe having figured out where to get their chips from. As you probably know, Intel and AMD have both stopped delivering chips to Russia and government entities were officially cut off from them completely. So enter a company called Danny, a motherboard maker across Russia, China and Turkey, which introduced a new motherboard supporting a Chinese Jiaoshin x86 CPU instead. The chip they used is an 8 core model made on a 16 nanometer process, clocked at 2.1 to 2.7 gigahertz. It has a bunch of slightly older but kind of current current-ish specs like 4 megabytes of L2 cache, 16 lanes of PCI 3.0, 2 memory slots for DDR4 RAM and so on. Now performance when compared to high-end Intel and AMD systems is apparently pretty terrible, but Danny can apparently make tens of thousands of motherboards per month and therefore government departments and institutions in Russia can at least buy something to run standard x86 programs on. So who the hell is Jiaoxin? Well, I talked about them in more detail in my in-depth chip video that you can see somewhere here, but here's the short of it. Jiaoxin started as a joint venture between the Shanghai Municipal Government and Taiwanese Via Technologies, an old chip company that was, fun fact, co-founded by Sher Wang, who also co-founded HTC. Anyway, back in the 90s, when Via was still somewhat relevant, they managed to acquire an x86 license through a bunch of mergers and antitrust settlements, and while they have been pretty irrelevant as a chip maker lately, they are now the only company other than Intel and AMD to still have one of these licenses. So they then brought that license to Jiaoxin, who used it to create a domestic x86 player in China. With the Chinese government ordering at least 50 million PCs on a central government level alone to switch to domestic technologies, a lot of PCs using Jiaoxin chips are expected to be sold domestically, and now, of course, those might start getting exported to Russia as well. A lot of Chinese users online have claimed that these new computers are basically terrible, but of course they're probably good enough to run like word processing and spreadsheets and whatever, so there's that, but there's basically two problems with this approach. First, these chips rely on X86 licenses, which of course Intel and AMD own. Now, I don't know the exact contractual terms, but I'm fairly sure that these licenses can be revoked if Jiaoxin ever becomes a real political threat. And second, Russia isn't even getting the newest Jiaoxin chips, only older ones. My guess is that that's because the newer ones are probably made by TSMC or Samsung or someone else who have halted their exports to Russia. In other words, this is far from a silver bullet that will save both of these countries but at least it's something. Now, in-depth engineering knowledge that is required to make all of these things happen is not just increasingly profitable, but it's also becoming a critical geopolitical resource, and there's no better place to develop real science and engineering knowledge that you and maybe even your country can benefit from than Brilliant. Knowledge in areas like machine learning, computer memory, quantum computing, and more. Brilliant's courses are crafted by award-winning teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Microsoft, Google, and more, and they cover topics from beginning 
beginner to advanced levels. The real brilliance of Brilliant is just how interactive and well-structured their courses are. Their courses help you learn by breaking down a complicated concept into small chunks and then you do an exercise after each so you practice what you've just learned right away. That ends up building a deeper understanding versus just listening to someone explain a concept without engaging in it. This way you can get better at your job, you can maybe pick up a whole new profession or you can just learn something to be smarter. You can try Brilliant for free at brilliant.org TFC and the first 200 people who sign up using that link will also get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So check them out, happy learning and I'll see you next week. Thank you.